Earlier today, I taught a classroom of 20 students about how we create electricity from the nuclear fission of uranium atoms. While this might not come as a shock to you all, it is certainly a surprise to me and to anyone who knew me before I started graduate school. I never imagined myself doing this. I'm a graduate student instructor, basically a TA, for a course called Energy and Society. It's cross-listed with the Goldman School and the Energy and Resources Group, and it's meant to help students understand the whole universe of energy and electricity. This course covers everything, from the chemical reactions that happen in the combustion chamber of a power plant, to the movement of electrons through power lines, to the environmental injustices associated with the production and consumption of energy, to the policies we can implement to remedy those injustices. It's chemistry and engineering and economics and sociology, and this week it's nuclear physics. I didn't expect to teach nuclear physics during my time at policy school. <laughs> I've always considered myself a social sciences person with a ca two capital S's and a capital P. In undergrad at Brown, I studied anthropology and international relations. I excelled in courses like ethnographies of the Muslim Middle East and war in film and literature while just scraping by in statistics. But after graduating in 2015, I fortuitously fell into a job in DC consulting for companies and nonprofits in the energy and climate space. I had no background in energy and climate. I just knew I wanted to work in the policy arena, and this was the first job I landed. As I took on utilities, energy associations, and environmentalist groups as my clients, I quickly learned three things. One, I didn't know nearly enough about how the electricity grid works to be credibly advising companies like PG&E on their lobbying strategy. <laughs> Two, that expertise can be faked with some sharp presentation and hours of panicked background research Googling basic questions like what is net energy metering and how do utilities make money? And three, I'm actually really interested in climate change mitigation and the role that energy can play in that. Maybe this job wasn't just a way for me to stay in DC, but the beginning of a career advancing climate policy. Flying by the seat of your pants and the strength of your Wi-Fi only takes you so far in consulting, particularly when it pertains to such technical issues as energy and climate policy. I decided I wanted to know more, to be better at my job, and to play a more proactive role in climate policy. So I decided to come back to school. I'm a concurrent degree student at GSPP and the Energy and Resources Group, also known as ERG which means that it'll take me three years to earn an MPP and a master's degree in energy and resources. As far as my parents are concerned, this means I'll have earned half a PhD, which is very exciting for them. <laughs> More substantively, it means I've split my time between two departments in an effort to learn both the languages of energy and policy. While I initially worried the split would be a challenge, it turns out that the programs fit together quite seamlessly. The core curriculum at GSPP has provided me with a skills-based education in equity, economics, statistics, and policy analysis. And from the Energy and Resources Group curriculum, I'm learning about which technical solutions work best and why. Should we invest in getting solar panels on every rooftop in America? What changes would we have to make to the grid to make that work? Who benefits and who doesn't? What, would that even be enough to, come to achieve our climate goals? Taking taken together, GSPP and ERG have already provided the holistic knowledge and skill base around climate policy that I came for, and I'm only a year and a half in. But what to do with this knowledge? GSPP students in particular are really preoccupied by the question, how can we do the most good with the knowledge that we've gained in policy school? The most good. So I've been thinking about the answer to this question for myself. What's the most good that I can do after Berkeley? Recently, I attended a talk by an alum of the Energy and Resources Group who does climate research and advocacy. His name is Chris Jones, and his organization, the Cool Climate Network, helps cities understand where their carbon dioxide emissions are coming from, and then recommends effective policies they might implement to cut those emissions. Chris spoke to a group of graduate and undergraduate students who have decided to spend their careers, or at least their academic lives, working on issues relating to climate change. In the first 10 minutes of his talk, Chris delivered a difficult but important truth. Unless our work has the potential to reduce hundreds of millions of tons of carbon dioxide emissions from the environment, 
We are wasting our time. The emergency of the climate crisis means we don't have time to tinker with marginal solutions that only impact a tiny slice of the problem. We can't focus on emissions from Berkeley or from California. We can't dedicate precious intellect and resources to building apps that help rich people manage their electricity usage or incremental regulations on small segments of the industrial sector. If our work is to be effectual, the scale of its emission reduction potential must be national or global. I've attended lots of great talks at Berkeley, but this one, given to a small group of students in a windowless classroom in Barrows Hall, has been the most electrifying. In the universe of green jobs, there's a lot of work that seems worthwhile. But if I really want my work to matter, it needs to eliminate hundreds of millions of tons of carbon dioxide, it needs to engage tens of millions of people, and it needs to have the potential to scale to national or global proportions. So what does such important work look like? As it turns out, it's mostly policy. Policy has the potential to transform our economies, to regulate polluting industries, to direct sustainable development, to correctly price the true social costs of consumption, such that it becomes too expensive for us to continue down this path to self-destruction. And as a policy student in a room mostly full of engineers, you can imagine how smug I was to learn that climate solutions would come from community organizing and legislative action, not from a laboratory. The technology we need to save ourselves already exists. We have clean electricity and battery storage and solar panels and sustainable farming practices and efficient cars and metal drinking straws. That was the easy part. Now comes the hard work of changing our behaviors around consumption through policy. So that's my plan after school. Pursuing a concurrent degree in public policy and energy and resources is giving me the fluency in the languages of policy and energy to pursue those goals. To act as a mediator between climate scientists and policymakers, to make the economic and political case for truly transformative climate policy. And as I stood in front of a classroom to teach undergraduates about nuclear energy, I can communicate the, import the importance of thinking big. The basic mechanics of a nuclear reactor are important to understand. And sure enough, I now mostly understand them. But even more important are if and how that nuclear reactor fits into the better world we're building for ourselves and for future generations. Taking advantage of my concurrent degree in public policy and energy and resources, I'm equipped to make meaningful systems change and impart upon my students that this potential is alive within them as well. So thank you for all you do and all you have done to help Goldman students like me do the most good. <laughs>